What's up, everybody? I'm Thomas J. Belez, and welcome to the second episode to the fifth season of the Right Mindset Podcast. I can't believe we've gotten this far, especially because I'm lazy. My beard <laughs> makes me do it, really. I, I'd rather be sleeping, is honestly the truth. Uh, but I'm actually here with somebody that I think will make an, a, a great conversation. Not only is she intelligent, uh, uh, wonderful as a person, and articulate with her thoughts, but Dr. Sheena Howard is an author, so you can even read her mind on the page and absorb it and assimilate it into your soul. And uh, with that, we are going to have a conversation today that could go anywhere, my friends, uh, because there was a previous episode with me and my buddy, good buddy, Jody, all right, Sperling, all right, and we were talking about marketing, and we always get passionate, of course you know this, because he's been on this show many times, uh, and uh, Dr. Sheena Howard has been like, hey, I have thoughts on this, and I'm sure we're going to talk about that, so let's get it, Dr. Sheena Howard, uh, how's it going? It's going good. I'm I'm excited to be here talking to you and like also digging into your mind a little bit more because I had questions on the podcast that I heard with you. I've heard you twice on his show. I'm pretty sure. Um, mm -hmm. But this last one, I really was like, I I wish I was asking the questions. I wanted to dig dig a little bit deeper. But um, it's going great. Things are going great. The author brand is doing better than ever, and you know. There's always another level with new problems and new challenges. It's just a, it's just a, a mountain that just keeps getting bigger. It feels like on this entrepreneurship journey. So um, I'm learning every day. I mean, it started originally with somebody standing outside of place and going, "Hey, here's a flyer. Please come in. We have some snake oil." Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> and then yep. it turned into Coca-Cola made yep. uh, Santa Claus. Believe it or not, the image of Santa Claus is a Coca-Cola product for marketing. Oh. Uh, with the Christmas spirit. Uh, I did and, not know that. that yeah, that's sense. right. Yeah, it is a trademark of Coca-Cola. Uh, well, it's gone now because after yeah. 75 years, you lose your trademark. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, the, the big puffy, happy, goal, lucky, big bearded yeah. Santa Claus is a Coca-Cola marketing ploy. Um, it's, it's amazing it. how marketing works. <laughs> yes. Oh, my goodness. And some things just really take off. Sometimes you never know the thing that's going to take off, which is interesting, too. Yeah, which brings us to Pepsi and uh, Dr. Pepper. These were both uh, items that weren't made to fight Coca-Cola on the market, but Dr. Pepper literally came from a pharmacist. You know, mm. he had it, and people come in, they'd get their pills or whatever, and he goes, oh, yeah, I made this soda thing, and then uh, one thing led to another, and it was uh, eventually bought out, and it became nice. Dr. Pepper, and uh, just recently became the second most popular drink on the market uh above pepsi and under coca-cola so. that makes sense hence the dr pepper maybe i yeah. have a dr howard soda yeah dr, dr. Howard Shino. i wonder which one has a better feel i'm more of a mr pib though because i couldn't handle the schooling <laughs> <laughs> miss sheena soda <laughs> yeah, there we go i like it i like it oh, yeah and uh what's interesting is dr pepper is actually uh its own company but it mm -hmm. is uh, licensed to both Pepsi and Coca-Cola. So when you have a Pepsi machine or something like Whoa. that, you can okay. have diet, uh, uh, you could have Dr. Pepper in that uh, machine. That makes sense. Wow. Interesting. Right. Does right. you just keep this information in your head? You're, yeah. you're a marketing branding guy, right? So That's right. I am an expert. Yes. Right. I, this is my, uh, I'm an expert on success. And like, I, I basically soft retired when I was like 27, 28 ish from mm -hmm. the music industry. Uh, mm -hmm. A couple of years after that, I got bored. So I got into comedy. Mm -hmm. I started focusing on my writing and doing some other things. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, I studied not only entertainers and success, uh, but like how businesses work. And a lot of my mentors were multimillionaires mm -hmm. and, uh, I'm, I'm in, I was impassioned by the process, not the results. Mm -hmm. And you learn very quickly that a lot of people focus on the results and not necessarily the process. So, right. and That's an author. Yes. Yeah. I have to, I, I constantly work on this, trying to just focus on the work, the process, the reps and not the result because like focusing on the result, sometimes the result is out of your control. Let's just start there. Um, you know, yeah. and it's just, reminding myself of that every day it is tough because you want to have goals right goals do for some people goals keep you alive like you want that thing so it keeps you on the straight and narrow but um some of the goals are just out of your control so it does come down to the reps and the in the process and the learning um mm -hmm. and the iterating and all that stuff is you know 
hard to say, but more important than the goal. Oh goodness, it's so hard to say that as a as a creative. <laughs> but um, it, it it's true though, because I know sometimes I have goals that are big, and in just trying to achieve those goals, I end up achieving something even greater that I didn't even think of. I might not even get that goal, but I'm like, oh my gosh, this amazing thing happened just in the pursuit of doing that thing, and that the thing that I got was actually better than yeah. the thing I was going after. That happens all the time. Yeah. And, you know, a, a thing with authors, especially when it comes to process uh, slash results, is they think, well, Stephen King wrote a book and published it and he became sex successful. So if I write a book and I publish it, I will become successful. Mm -hmm. And that's looking at results first, not process. And process mm -hmm. is, well, nobody knows who you are. Yeah. So how that's do I build that brand? Well, I'll, I'll write the book because if I write the book, it will sell because I wrote a book yeah. because that's what Stephen King did. Yeah. And if I get, and if I publish it either self or traditionally, well, that's what he did. And that's what Oprah does. And that's what the, you know, and you, you know, Nora Roberts and all, and you realize, no, that's if you yeah. look at Stephen King's story, he did not write a book and publish it. He wrote hundreds, if not thousands of very small articles that he worked very hard to get into little magazines. And right. he started building his name and his brand mm -hmm. and his style by being these little short stories here and there. But he had a little tiny nail and he put mm -hmm. it in his wall and he filled it up with rejections. Then he got a bigger nail, and filled that up with rejections until he had a nail that went into the tracks for a train. And it was mm -hmm. like this big nail. And he filled that up with rejections before Carrie got published yeah i think a lot of times when we see successful people or just people that we want to maybe model our career after I, I think we do miss critical details in their story and it looks like oh, so it's just like one two three steps and but there's like so much in between that either we're not privy to or we don't study them long enough in, in, in as much detail um and so i think that that tends to be like a trap but also the other trap is you can follow their exact steps and you will not have their exact result because yes. you are an individual with different contexts and different all types of things and the world changes. And like, so yeah, you're really forging your own path through the process and the work and hoping something great happens <laughs> and learning as you go to, to, to increase your sphere of luck and opportunity. And, and <laughs> that stuff is just takes work every day. Well, like, let's say we look at Stephen King and just, you know, again, if we followed his path, the things we couldn't do identical was write his words, write his books because they're already written, but also the people he met, right. the way he was represented. All these avenues have changed. However, if we look at every successful person, whatever it is, they could be a business owner from uh, Sam Walton and Walmart to Stephen King writing an authorship, right? They networked because they had to build relationships. They marketed because they had to build a relationship with their brand, their audience, and the people that remembered them, the impression he left on it. But he also had to learn the industry. He thought if I write, I'll be successful. And then he had to learn, oh, no, I keep getting rejected. I guess I'll start somewhere. And just by default, he started submitting to magazines. And, and they kept saying no. And then eventually they said, yeah. And he's like, all right, maybe that's the way to do it. Mm -hmm. But he wasn't getting leaps and bounds to his careers until the magazine person was like, well, I like you, so I'm going to help you with this. And then mm -hmm. another person said, I like you, and I'm going to help you with this. Mm -hmm. And people don't realize like, oh, all right, I do need the network. But how I go about it, that's that's my variable. I could do that however I feel comfortable. Mm. I do need to network, mm -hmm. right? But I also need to market. I don't have to do it how they did it, mm -hmm. but I do have to. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, again, you said you listened to the Jody, the last uh, uh, audio. And one of the things I said is like, all right, fine. Be the greatest you can be in the world. It just you are the most amazing writer in the world. But you're not allowed yeah. to tell anyone that you wrote a book. You're not allowed to go out and talk to people that you're an author. All you can do is write that book and put it in the closet and close the door and just happily wait for the uh, millions and millions of people to knock mm -hmm. on your door and pay you money. Mm -hmm. And that's not how it works. The book right. is not the thing that sells the book mm -hmm. because he said something. I don't know if it was on this episode, but another episode. We definitely we've done a lot of episodes together. I've only listened to two. Episodes. See, now I got to go back fishing for the rest of because I love them. I love on YouTube. I go back and forth. I love it. Yeah, we get really impassioned. Uh, we we definitely have two different uh, stances. But um, one of the things is like, you know, just because you're great doesn't doesn't mean people know you're great. Like you can't tell your someone you're great. It's it's right. subjective. 
And it's right. and it's, and I tell people, I go, anything you say as as a fact is is a lie. Right. Like if I go, this is a great book because I wrote it. That's a lie because <laughs> there's there's no proof. Wait, can something be great? With, so are you saying that something is only great in the minds of the people? Correct. Like the people make it great because they read it and tell everybody about it. And, yeah. And that's why there could be something that is popular that other people hate. Like. But, yes. But once you're established, now mm -hmm. your now your thing, whoever you are and what you do can become the like Michael Jordan. He is great. Like we can right. look at him and based on everything he's done, the, right. the majority perspective goes, everything he's done is great, mm -hmm. but he had to earn that. Right. But what I'm saying is we couldn't say that he's great until we actually saw him. So right. if he just For played sure. in his backyard and he was not as good as his brother, his brother mm. was better than him. He's gone. He's, he said that he said his brother inspired him to play basketball. Yeah. But his brother, do you know his? Did you even know he no, had a brother? I, I didn't even know. He, I didn't even know he had a brother. But he so was better than Jordan. His luck. How how much of a cre of a creator's success do you think is luck? I know this is a tough question. If you had to break it, because I have this thing with luck. I hate the word luck because I feel like it's disempowering. And when people say I was at the right place at the right time, well, you had to put your clothes on and get up to go to that place to be at the right. So I understand that it was the right place, the right time, but you, you did have to continue to put yourself in situations to meet people for the opportunity. Um, and so I don't like to use the word luck because I just think it's disempowering, but I do also think that timing is important. All, all of these things. And so I'm all about increase your sphere of luck, right? <laughs> and increase your opportunity to get lucky and lucky things will happen. Um, but I'm curious your thoughts on the luck piece, the right time, the right place, right time type of situations. All right. Uh, two things. The first is I'm going to tell you a Tony Braxton, uh, Tony Braxton story, you know, uh, uh, all right. Uh, you know, and then, um, I'm going to tell you a story about kiss, but before I do that, uh, I believe no matter what the percentage is in your mind, it's one in a million. And if you do that, you'll start thinking in proactive effort instead of reactive effort. I like that. Right. Mm -hmm. So whatever it could, it could, the percentage could be really high, really low too. It could be like, right. you know, you walk outside and someone's like, oh, you have the perfect look. Right. But if you stay with the one in a million, you'll start being proactive and you'll start taking mm -hmm. action. Right. And especially uh, thinking outside the box in a proactive way will lead yeah. to quote unquote luck opportunities. Mm -hmm. And this brings us to Tony. Uh, she was literally singing outside her car while filling up her gas tank. And mm. a music producer was on the other side filling up his car and heard her and said, oh, my God, your voice is amazing. Wow. But now people don't tell you her story. Her story is she was already in a church choir with her sisters, her literal sisters. And they said they only wanted her. And she is like, no, I can only do it with my sisters. And they were like, what are you doing? Like, just do this. Like, go right. right? There was she didn't even want to risk and sacrifice what she built with her sisters because of that loyalty to take this opportunity, mm -hmm. you know. And then she had she didn't make an album directly after that. They had to develop her. So they were like moving around to meet other producers and executives and all these other people. And they liked her and they had to establish opportunity. It was a lot of work. Mm -hmm. Now we go back to Kiss. Kiss's mm -hmm. manager at the time was the one who basically said you should wear the makeup. Mm -hmm. But that manager only exists because the manager's boyfriend was like, hey, come see this band. They're my buddies mm -hmm. uh, before we go out to dinner and we check it out. And they were like, I don't want I don't like rock. <laughs> But because they were in a relationship, right. they went. And they were like, wow. And it was one of their first shows, you know? Mm -hmm. And that led to them getting their manager, who then in turn helped them establish certain elements to their success. Um, so are those situations luck? Or right. are they a mixture of, you know, all the stars aligning and then right. you being able to say yes? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, that's also important you know mm -hmm. I, I talk about how Halle Barry lived in homeless shelters wow right? yeah and, which is true and mm -hmm. and so did uh, Tyler Perry he lived in his car yeah that one I knew yeah right and it's like well how do we do that same thing without living in a car or a homeless shelter well save up money and then mm -hmm. people are like no 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 I, I'll wait and I'm like listen 
It's a business. If you right. save up 18 months worth of uh, startup capital, that'll cover your overhead so you can do two things, not work a job. Mm -hmm. And also you'll be able to say yes to opportunities that specifically fit your brand's mission. Yes. There's a like, um, yeah, yeah, actors. yeah. That's so true. It's right. And actresses, especially right. When I, when I work with actresses, especially back in the day, mm -hmm. uh, I always would tell them, I go, look, if you don't want to be known for nudity, don't do nudity. Right. But then you see the paycheck for nudity and, and you, you're like, I need to pay my bill. Like, yep. And it's like, now I have to take off my clothes and, and you yep. don't even have lines. You're just, you're the person that like, do you remember the name of the actress? in Wolf of Wall Street where Leonardo DiCaprio snorted cocaine no, off of her naked no. body? No. no. She made a lot of money, though, right. and it paid her bills. But if you have the power to say no, you become the next person. Like, you become Arnold Schwarzenegger. Right. Arnold Schwarzenegger was a millionaire before his acting career because he went into real estate, created assets, developed money. Mm. Right? And he didn't make as much money as you think. Mm. Through a muscle posing, he only made enough to afford little things. And he had to create partnerships to start mm -hmm. up a business for b doing uh, um, walls. He built walls and helped uh, right. do renovations right. for houses. And then he found another partner for real estate. And right. one thing led to another. And then his model was, I'm not going to say yes to anything that isn't the thing I want. Right. Or getting I'm me closer to the thing that I want. I think that goes back to like brand, that the brand that you're building and the associations matter in getting to the thing you want. Um, especially that story that you just shared with Leonardo DiCaprio and the, 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 the female actress, you know, that people are going to associate you with those type of roles, which could be totally opposite of actually the, the actor that you want to be in the roles that you want to take in the future. Um, and so, yeah, yeah, that's, that's interesting. I like your frame for, just assume that what you're trying to do is like one in a million because mm -hmm. psychologically it will motivate you to just go hard and just show up. If you're like, this is a one in a million thing. I'm just going to every day, I'm going to go in here and, and do the actions required to try to get the thing. I think the hard part for creatives is like, you never know what's, if it's going to work, but that comes back to <laughs> focusing on the result a little bit yeah. and not the process. Cause I think, you know, the worst feeling is like, man, I did all this work for 10 years and I did not even get close to the thing that I was trying <laughs> to get to. And that is just so scary for uh, creatives. My advice to that is every three years, reevaluate where you are. And mm. if you are not, because again, every three years, if you're not where you are, you're technically a failed business. But statistically speaking, it takes three years to be successful with a business. If you're not, you did something wrong, right? Mm -hmm. But most creatives, and I say this by being experienced in that world, they'll say, oh, I haven't done it. I'll just work harder doing the thing I have been doing. Yeah. And then they do another three years of that same thing. And now they've done six years of the same thing yeah. and nothing has changed. Mm -hmm. And they're just thinking, wow, why are people now they're starting to get jaded? Why aren't people recognizing me? I'm really good. I'm awesome, amazing, unique. Mm -hmm. I, I have a great product. Mm -hmm. My thing, this book right here is the best book ever. Yeah. And they're like, you know what? I'll just work harder at the same thing I've been doing. Yeah. And it's nine years. Mm. And oh. now it's everyone else's fault. No one's giving me a chance. The system, right. blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and you're like, how many people do you know that you talk to? Well, I, I know a lot of people, but they don't. They can't really do anything for me. But what mm. can you do for them? Mm. Why would I give them any help? Well, because other people see that you have value. You have resources. Right. You're able to help people when you're involved, you elevate the tables you join. So they're going to want you. That's and true. Yeah. I get so many people. Um, cause like I have a big page, right? I just get messages all the time, um, on Instagram, particularly mm -hmm. the number of artists. And I talk about this constantly cause it drives me crazy. I get it. But the number of artists, particularly like, uh, people who draw and illustrate mm -hmm. that message me out of the blue, there's no connection. I don't know you at all. And they're like, mm -hmm. Hey, I would love to work with you someday. Here's a link to my art. Dude, that's not going to get you in. Like, you're you're not adding value. You're asking me to do work, to click on your link, to look at your art, to decide how I want to work with you. And that's mm -hmm. not- To help them. To, to help them get to my level. And I'm like, that is not networking. That is not networking in, um, 
I try to share these strategies in my Patreon community. Like, hey, and because listen, I've been there. Like, right, old, old me, I have done, right. I think everybody needs to probably go through this process in their younger years to learn that, okay, you're not getting results doing that thing. Um, so you have to try something else. But networking takes time too, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's not a, it's not like a, I do this and I make a sale or I get in, I get this big opportunity. Sometimes it can be like that when you get good, but there it's like a relationship build, right? Yeah. Um, and that could be hard. Everything is time. And, Everything like, time. and this goes back to your point about if you have money in the bank, you can make better decisions. Yes. You can make right decisions. You can put time into things. You could say yes because you need to, not because you have to. Um, and when it comes to networking, if you look at networking as the people you know and not really about what can they do for me, your circle of influence will start influencing better habits because you're going to surround yourself with the people that have good habits. Mm -hmm. um, networking is not about making money. It's about mm -hmm. building a relationship with people that inspire you, that mm -hmm. elevate you, and not necessarily your career, or if they go, hey, I want you to do this. That's marketing. So the networking is building those relationships, right? So you can get involved in helping them and their missions. right? And then they get to see you in real time performing your values. Mm -hmm. And that is the impression you leave on them. And then what happens? They're going to say, hey, I have another thing coming up. You're the person I'm thinking of because right. not only are you present mm -hmm. and I'm seeing you. So be seen, be present, right? right? But I like what you stand for. I like how you add value. You, you, uh, Your energy is great. I'm going to take you along with me. Exactly. And that's really what you have to do. The networking is you putting time into people. The marketing is people remembering you through your right. actions. Uh, right. And a, a lot of people focus on what can you do for me, though? Yep. Right. They, they, like, I'm an author, and <laughs> so I'm only going to make friends with people that can help me publish my book or make sales. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to post things that are like, hmm, what? Oh, you you have a huge platform, so we should do something together. Exactly. But, but why should we do something together? Right. Because I have this really great book, and I think it'll. But that, how does that elevate my mission? You you don't have the value yet. Right. You haven't earned that position to use me. You know. And, this, and listen, what you're saying is also, um, what you're saying is also social media strategy. By the way, so. I work with a lot of creatives on building their let's let's focus on Instagram specifically because it's a great platform to build relationships so that you can make sales down the line. Mm -hmm. And I tell people, especially authors, but creatives in general, I tell them, if you want to build your social media, stop focusing on trying to sell things. If you can stop focusing on trying to sell things, ironically, you will make sales <laughs> because social media to grow, to get the brand awareness is adding value to people's life the videos that you're posting on social media if you're there to grow and run a business the videos are not for you it's yes. for the other people and you have to build up a, a a well of goodwill you can't be selling your book every other post because you haven't <laughs> built up the credibility you haven't built up the emotional connection you you haven't done anything for them to ask them to buy your book and i tell people like Dude, you're like three months out from even asking for your first sale. So go post three times a day and add tremendous value every single day. And in three months, come back to me. Then we can talk about trying to sell something. And people just can't. I think this goes back to your point. If you have money in the bank where you can wait, you'll make better decisions. But social media is also about building the relationship mm -hmm. um, first. And then yep. you can ask people to buy. And you really can't ask people to buy. It's like 10% that you should be selling something on your page. The other stuff is like entertaining. What, what you, you're people. either a salesperson or you're supplying a demand. And those are two different things. Mm -hmm. Like Kiss plays shows because they have the demand. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Right. If they didn't, then they'd have to sell the idea of coming to their shows. Ah, yeah, I like that. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So one of my mentors in the music industry told me that. They go, "You shows are not for building audiences, just like books are not for building audiences. Right. Like they have to connect to you and be interested in you and want to support you and they're your fanship. And then people go, wait a minute, 
if shows aren't for building audiences, then how do I get them to know I exist? Mm. Oh, you do interviews. What do you mean? Well, if they listen to your song, they're either going to like it or not like it. <laughs> but if they listen to you talk in an interview, yes. they're going to like, dislike, somewhat like, agree, somewhat agree, disagree. Yeah. And they're going to have all this roller coasters of emotions while they're building a relationship with the impression you're leaving right. on them. The stories you're sharing, who you are, the context about your life will get yes. the emotional connection for them to then be, be at your show. To be at your show. And then they go, right. oh, I wonder what, if they think like this and I agree with some of the things, I wonder what their music's like. Exactly. I wonder what their book is like. But uh, to your point, are you saying, okay, are you, I I'm doing this uh, facetiously. You know, <laughs> are you claiming that if I was an author and I posted on social media and I went, hey, this book is really great. I wrote it. I think it's one of my best books mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, and if you buy it, you'll be, you'll be rewarded. You'll be, it'll be an experience that I know you will appreciate. Cause I put my heart and soul into this and it's so good. This book, yeah. you don't understand that that deserves a sale. No, that's never going to make a sale. Unless you sure? Friend <laughs> or your, your family. Um, friends and family yeah well you know that's right no no you you have to you have to build a relationship first um exactly. and and building the relationship is actually not talking about your book it's talking yep. about you the, the the reason why you write the things you believe in creative storytelling around the book maybe even the themes of the book before you even tell them that you that you have a book it is okay to leave the link to your book in your profile but in oh, terms yeah. of the content um you need to build an emotional connection with people before yep. they'll buy anything from you because i think authors underestimate what they're asking people to buy they think i'm just asking you to buy this really good book that's ten dollars but that's not all you're asking them to buy you're asking them to trust that your book will be worth the time that they're going to take out to read it you're actually asking them to, to pull out their credit card and, and put their numbers in, even if it's Amazon, right? You're you're asking them to believe in you. You're, you're, you're not just asking them to spend $10. You're asking them to make space on their bookshelf for another book that they yep. probably don't need, right? And so I think authors think it's only a $10 book. People should, or, or let me make it $1.99 and more people will buy it. And then they see that, no, even though, even the book, even when you make the book $1.99, people still don't want it because they're underestimating what they're actually asking people to buy. Yeah. Uh, that comes down to, if you have a service, do I charge $10 an hour because I want more work or do I charge $150 an hour because I want quality yeah. and the people who are going to pay $150 are not going to ask you to cut corners. The people right. who pay $10 are going to go, yeah, but could I, could I pay you like after? Yep. And you're like, yep. no, it's $10. I, you know, I do 10 hour retainers. I need it up front. Yeah. Oh, well, maybe I could do like, you know, the uh, half and then, you know, and you're like, all right, these are not the people I want to work with. I want to work. For sure. You know. For sure. And the, the, the clients that pay the most are the best clients. Like my $70,000 clients that I ghostwrite books for the best. They're like, where do I pay? <laughs> when do you need me to show up for this interview? When are you going to have the first three chapters? Like, is there, yeah. and then the $10,000 clients are just, it's just, is a whole different world and a whole other set of, of issues that you have to confront as a creative if you're at that price point now. Um, you know, you, but you do have to climb up the ladder. You're not going to start charging. You're not going to start your ghostwriting career charging 70000 You need social proof. You need brand. But I'm so good. I said I'm good. <laughs> right? I, I'm great. You don't, you don't trust me? My mom trusts me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> do you see how yeah. like yeah. Wild the the idea like there's nothing wrong with believing in because you have to like why would you do it then like if you didn't believe your book is great like why would you write it right but that being the only per, per, thing that's propelling your potential for sales is uh dangerous because not mm -hmm. only are you going to fuel the misconception that if your book is great it will sell like that's not true it's mm -hmm. that statement can't be objectively false i mean uh, objectively true it just there's not enough information or results because if that was the case every single book that 
everybody thought was great would sell yeah. just by writing it. They would finish the last sentence and there would be knocks on the door. Right. You right. know, but that's not how it works. I really, I really appreciated your, um, for people that haven't listened to the episode with you and Jody, shout out to Jody's podcast. Jody. By the way. I love it. Like I love his podcast. Um, I really appreciated your breakdown of, I think it was the Oscars. You were talking about how to get an Oscar. Yeah. I really appreciated your breakdown of how that actually happens because I think most, most people do think, Oh, it's just the best actor or actress but your breakdown your breakdown kind of reminds me of like the new york times bestseller list it's like the the best written books are not go some of the best written books are will never be new york times bestsellers because that's a different process as well like yep. you know a ceo can write a book and get all of their other ceo friends to buy balk for their employees and now they got enough sales to be on the new york times bestsellers list right so it's like i have it's kind of a similar kind of thing like just because you write a really good book does it does it mean it, there are terrible books on the New York Times bestsellers that are not that <laughs> greatly written? And we all know that. Um, so I really appreciated that breakdown. Do you agree with the statement that uh, just because I haven't won an Oscar, I don't understand the process? Oh, no, because if you because if you've <laughs> been a part of the process, if you've helped people get an Oscar or even if you've just been a part of any type of committees that are responsible for, for that. No, you don't, you don't need yes. to. I, to, I was very, to, uh, yeah. Not only are, do I have friends who write for the Oscars, uh, but I, uh, you know, for many, many years, I was a part of the SAG after union as in like, I was a part of it. Like I was running for office. I worked very closely with the president at the time, my cod shout out, unfortunately, rest in peace. Uh, you know, we are Hodgins as we say. Um, but, when you start, re like, because the claim was that uh, Robert De Niro is a great actor. That's why he wins. But there are other great actors that have won Oscars. But when they were still great back in the day, they weren't a name. So the studio wasn't pushing them because Robert De Niro is going to fill the seats and going to get the money in the table. Whereas somebody that wasn't as successful or famous, right? But then you say, well, what about the piano? You know, you you had a young actress and she went because well, she was the only actress. She was the other lead. And that was the sell of the movie was that this young child actress playing the piano was acting opposite this amazing actor who also got an Oscar nomination. Right. It wasn't an ensemble piece. It was yeah. these two people. So they were going to go, hey, but then you get interviewed a vampire and, you know. The little young yeah. girl that we know today, obviously, but, uh, you know, Kirsten Dunst, she yeah. won an MTV award. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. she wasn't nominated because you had Brad Pitt and you had Tom Cruise. Like, right. she's not going to get... And the interview with a vampire only won, uh, I believe it only won best uh, effects, I believe. Because mm -hmm. it, it, it insane effects. Um, but yeah, no, Oscars, Grammys are the same way. And yeah. it's basically... And awards, awards are... are... <laughs> In my experience, awards are never really about the best. Sometimes it's really just connections. Sometimes, it, like, um, it, it just is, right? Like, I don't think that they're the best metric to they are determine how good someone is because there's so many other things involved besides, especially when it comes to art. I mean, just something this is objectively better than this. Um, but as we know, as creatives, they do help help your career, obviously. Um, so it probably if you're a writer, being on a New York Times bestsellers list doesn't have to be. You can create your own metrics of success, but that probably should be on your list at some point. But it doesn't. It, it's, it's a lot more than just this. This even some books that sell enough to be on these lists will not be on the list because there's everybody knows there's a selection committee and all that. Well, do you want the asterisk or do you want probably, to earn it yeah. because you're? You yeah, know, exactly. You're, well, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, I have a funny story about that very thing where it's the people, you know, so my band back in the day, we did uh, basically like um, like the the world's greatest band kind of like competition that would lead to certain things and, you know, a tour and, you know, X, X, Y, Z. And it was levels. You had different levels, but each level me specifically. And then like my number two guy and then a couple of the other band members, we just made amazing friends with every everybody involved from the people that ran the doors to the money to the person doing the hosting to the people running it behind the scenes every time we showed up we said hello to everybody we made them laugh we talked to them if they needed help with something 
everybody helped. Mm-hmm. Oh, you want us to move stuff? Hey, we'll help you. We don't care. We won every level. And then the second to last level, the band we were playing against paid for two full buses of because it was based on how many people were there who voted for you. Mm-hmm. So they ba- they paid for two full buses of all their friends and family to come out to Brooklyn. They filled up the place. We had people there too, but they filled up the place. At the end of the thing, the guy turned to me. He goes, listen, I got to go out there and say that this band won. Um, but we're going to say it was a tie. Wow. Because they had more people that voted because they brought we right. didn't bring people. They showed up, but they right. brought. And he goes, but we're going to give you guys a tie so you can go to the last round. So you can follow, you know, so you could break because they're going to do this again. And we're yeah. like, yeah. So we're like, all right. So we only won that round to the last round because of that. But then they yeah. brought four buses. Right. Yep. And, because, and we brought we brought a lot of people, but they yeah. were like they knew yeah. they had to really put it in. But that's an example of just we they liked us as Absolutely. people. Absolutely. Right. You know, but we lost right. we, so, because they brought more people, you know. Exactly. But. It's, it's, it's just not always about the quality. There's so many other things when it comes to awards. I don't know if you know how I met Jody. Did he ever tell you? No, no, no. I like I um met him on Twitter, I believe. I stuck he you know, he asked these yeah, questions yeah, yeah, yeah. on Twitter. Uh, and then one day I reached out to him and I was like, I need a writing coach. Do you do writing coaching? Um, so like shout out to him because he coached me for a year just out of the the goodness of his own heart uh and one of the things that we worked on was trying to get me a literary agent because i had told him i'm just i'm just frustrated like yeah i have this whole body of work um proof positive that my books sell and do well and people write all of these things and so we worked for a whole year on getting a literary agent which didn't happen by the way people assume that i have an agent which I've never had an agent. An agent has never even reached out to me to even consider <laughs> representing me. Um, and, you know, I do think that even that comes down to relationships yes. as well. Correct. You know, I, I coach a lot of people who have never published anything and they have an agent and they're coming to me to help them either get rid of their agent because they're like, I've been with this agent for two years and they don't care about my book. So I'm like, hey, you know, you can do this without an agent. And there's a kind of some shortcuts, right? It's called. Yeah, like, they probably don't care about the book because exactly. they want, exactly. you know, what can um, you do for me? Yeah. And so at, at this stage of my career, Thomas, people always um, ask me, well, why do you even care about having a literary agent anyway? Like you've done so much more than a lot yeah. of people with agents. And I'm like, listen. Yes, I have, but I believe in team members. Agents have networks that I don't, it's always good to have, you You got to increase your dots on the page, right? I don't know everybody. An agent knows more people than me, can connect me to more opportunities and can save me time in having to pitch my books directly to publishers, right? All of these things matter. <laughs> um, and so I do want that team member on my team and I will continue to try to make that happen, but it just hasn't happened for me. And as 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 a thought exercise, uh, what can you do for the agent? Mm. Every agent and every manager I've ever had, either be literary or otherwise, has first and foremost been an introduction from a very close friend who's okay. very close with them. The okay. second thing is I came into their group being able to do something for them. My, one of my skill sets is, is educating people and helping them align their brands, et cetera, mm-hmm. et cetera. So for managers and agents, what That's did so I do? Good. They gave me some of their other clients and I helped elevate them. That's so good. Right. That's so so good. I asked I never you, asked myself that question. What can you bring run. to your agent? Mm. Right. But a lot of clients for the agent, you either have the, I'm waiting for them to do something, but they're not doing something for me. They should be doing something for me. They're, they're here for me. And they're like, well, you're one of many people they represent. <laughs> but at the same time, If you're like, let's say you and Stephen King got signed to the same agent. Let's say he dropped his agent for some weird reason Mm -hmm. and you and him got signed to the same agent on the same day. There's a greater chance they're going to put more effort into Stephen King because it's a direct return on their investment. Mm -hmm. You might not have the same brand value or draw or supply and demand, right? You don't have the, the demand for them to put the same effort. And in that situation, you might appear... Well, they don't care about me. They're not mm-hmm. putting time into me. I need a new agent. And you might be right, 
but maybe how can I, Hey, I can volunteer my time. What do you need? You want me to help you with some of your other literally your other clients yeah are thinking like that you're adding value to the tables you're entering that table to elevate the mission by leading following or advising mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and now they're gonna go you are an asset i'm gonna put a word in for you for something else that's amazing and i, I never that's 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 genius <laughs> you're so good you're so good at this um yeah, I never thought about it like that. There's lots of things that I can offer agents as well. Besides, hey, here's my book. Can you can you represent me? Um, exactly. I mean, you said it great. You said, I'm looking for a team member. Well, yeah. are you a part of the team or are they your employee? That's right. Mm. Team is both ways. How do we That's help right. one another? You know? Um, right. Yeah, like, like for example, uh, one thing that I was taught uh, very early on from one of my mentors is every time you meet someone of value, introduce them to at least two people of value in your circle where you get nothing out of it. Mm. But also those two people of value have to be able to like everyone you're introducing needs to be able to benefit from it. It can't be a one way street for those people. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if you do that, you start building your implied and right your impression with them. That's right. And yeah, I think this is a great conversation because I think a lot of people assume that, oh, I don't have any value to give this person. They, 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 um, they underestimate themselves. Like since I get the opportunity to write for celebrities, when you see them and you don't know them, you think they have everything. And then when mm -hmm. you get to have a close up relationship with them, you realize, oh, they really don't know how to do this basic thing. Like you think like, oh, you, right. And like, like some of the, like I've been able to write for DMC from run DMC. Um, mm -hmm. I've written, written a couple things for him. And some of the things he asked me, I'm like, don't you have people for that? I can help you. Right. It's just, it's just fascinating because our perception of the value that we can or cannot offer someone that is ahead of us is a little bit skewed because we're down here and we think they're up here, but sometimes it's just like, no, they actually do need your help. You're just not offering them that thing. And you're assuming that they already have it or have access to it just because they're famous. And that just might not be the case. Yep. yep. Yeah. You don't want to be uh, you don't want to fall into, Hey, I think I'm mansplaining, but in reality it's lack of communication. You know, even in those situations where it feels like you're being mansplained to, it's like, but no one's communicating that they know or don't know information. So it's better to present the information. Uh, if anything, you might learn something from it. And, right. uh, you know, it's it goes down to a conversation I have often with people where it's there's a value there's a perspective of what we are experiencing versus the objective truth of reality, and just because we feel something, and that feeling is true doesn't mean that's what's happening. So we need to just by default at least ask one follow up question mm. to that feeling to understand because we if we're only relying on what we can perceive we don't have all the information. A really great example of that is watching two guys and one guy gets punched in the face and you say that person hates them. But all you saw was the punch. So objectively, they did get hit by that person, but you don't know all the truth. Maybe right. they were threatened. The other person was threatening them, but you didn't right. hear it. Maybe right. they they have a relationship and something went wrong. Like we don't know what we don't know. And if that's we right. are only relying on our feelings, we don't have the evidence. And that's why you can't go to jail without people <laughs> asking questions. Right. You know, I feel they were going to rob me right. Right. You know, because they stood next to me for three seconds. You were online at the deli. Yeah. Right. But why were they next to me? Well, because they were behind you waiting to. Yeah. But I, my feelings are real. Yes. You absolutely felt that. Right. But that doesn't mean it is the reality. You need at least the follow up question. Yeah. At minimum. Yeah. Um, <laughs> this, this, this has been enlightening. You know, it's funny because for my books, I usually just, you know, speaking of networking, I just go direct to the publishers. Like a lot of people think, oh, you need an agent to even be able to pitch someone at the, the top five. And I'm like, actually, if you just kind of met the VP of acquisition at a networking party and they liked you, you could just pitch them directly without an agent. I've done that. Now mm -hmm. they haven't liked my idea, but right. It's a lot, it's a lot closer than waiting in line for an agent. And so um, just knowing that is empowering as well. Cause it's not just one way to get to where you're trying to get. It's, you know, it's, it's like these items are on the menu, but there's another menu. If you just ask a couple questions or, 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 or try to think through, well, how can I get something that's off the menu, right? My favorite is uh, the idea that I need a product. 
that mm. statement. So based on what you're saying, right? Oh, I'm going to go talk to an agent or a publisher directly, even in the film industry. I'm going to go to a producer or a studio person and I need the perfect, most polished script or book in the world. A couple things with that. A, the script is definitely going to be rewritten. <laughs> yeah. In fact, you might not even be the one who rewrites it. Uh, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And yeah. the same thing with the book. The book is going to go through a heavy editing process because the publisher has a brand themselves. There's a style to the books they represent. The, the, the other element to that is, believe it or not, a majority of my meetings came from synopsis. Mm. So if you go to sell ideas, go with five ideas of just the synopsis for stories. If they like the story, they hire you. What do they do when they hire you? They pay you the third up front to write. Then when you get to a certain point, they give you the second third, and then you finish it. And once it's qualified, they give you the third, the final third. And mm -hmm. that's the same thing that happens in the movie industry. But people think, oh, I need a full book. And da, 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 da. Mm. It's like, you don't need a full book. You don't even need it to be perfect. Right. Like, they say not to even edit your book when you send it to a publisher or agent, right? Because they're going to edit or publish it. Your agent's right. going to have notes and so is the publisher. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, so why it's like somebody spending $3,000 on editing mm -hmm. their first draft. Yeah. Yeah. Like you're going to send it to beta readers or right. you're going to rewrite stuff, right? Yeah. Right. Well, I just want it to be perfect though. Well, wait to the end. It's literally right. the last step. <laughs> Line editing. <laughs> copy editing yeah you, you know what I mean? yeah. <laughs> yeah no that's that's definitely a a perspective shift that i'm definitely gonna explore i love that yeah, um yeah. quick question sure, sure you said that branding wasn't a part of marketing i'm right. I, I wanted you to elaborate on that i was like screaming at, at the, my phone when i was listening to the podcast because i've always thought about branding as part of of marketing where marketing is like the sales piece but branding is a is a step in that process so it's all under the same umbrella so, yeah. but I, so i want to hear you elaborate on your um perspective on that so the reason i separate the two is because marketing specifically is uh building awareness for a brand to create interest for that brand that ultimately generates sales for people to buy into that brand's message emotionally Mm -hmm. which means that it is a separate thing because branding is your missions, your morals, and your, you know, your purposes, things like that. So mm -hmm. it's the things that represent who you are. Mm -hmm. Marketing is designed specifically to represent through presentation that brand. Right. And that's why I separate them because it also can get confusing. You know, if you're like, mm -hmm. Oh, branding and marketing are the same thing, but they're really not. One is like, well, what do I care about? How do mm -hmm. I care about represent? How do I care about, Oh, I, I believe that we shouldn't lie to one another. So I'm not going to lie because one of my morals is being honest with people. Mm -hmm. Right. So my mission is to always be honest, to influence others, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And so my purpose for that is I think we should live in a more open and communicative uh, environment where even the truth, no matter how bad it is, doesn't result in hatred, but a communication. Mm -hmm. That's it. So that I just did mission, morals and purpose. Right. Mm -hmm. That has nothing to do with marketing. The marketing mm -hmm. is taking that now and going, how do I represent that through presentation? Okay. That, that's why I separate them. So is this a fair example of what you just described? Branding is what I do on social media when I post content, not asking for sales when I post content, but marketing is the sales page that says the right things that has the link to buy. Would you say that? Social media, the moment you post something is the marketing okay. because that is the presentation through representation, okay. right? What you write is branding. So the words you choose, the subjects you choose to post about, the theme. Okay. Uh, again, you said it earlier. If you go to a page and it's buy my book, buy my book, buy my book, buy my book. Your brand is I'm a salesperson and I'm desperate for you to buy my book because mm -hmm. I need money. I'm hungry. And then the marketing is only focusing on sales. Okay. So what you post, like the, the intent and how it represents you is the branding element. But anytime it becomes public, that's marketing because okay. you're, you're, it's representation through presentation, right? So what uh, if, what if I, let's say I have a social media page mm -hmm. and for a whole week, like I never sell anything. I'm just building my audience. What, 
it sucks. I know you just said as soon as you hit publish, that's marketing. That is marketing because you're representing. So, so, even, so even if even if I have no intent to sell, you're I'm still set, doing marketing. Yeah, because your marketing has nothing to do with sales either. Okay. Right. Elaborate. Yeah. Elaborate for me on that. So I. Sure. So I mean, obviously, we want to sell. Yes. But again, marketing is solely to build awareness for the brand that will eventually create interest that ultimately will generate sales. So people buy into your brand's message emotionally. Mm -hmm. None of that has to do with money because once they're attached to you emotionally, now you're creating demand and now you have to supply that demand. And that means they're going to purposely go to your page or they're going to go to wherever it is. They can buy you, see you, whatever the case is. If your marketing and branding is motivated by money, you've mm -hmm. already lost. If you listen to- I agree. I agree. It goes back to what I said earlier. Like when I told my author, stop focusing on selling anything. Yes. Because that's why you can't create good content. Yes. Marketing must be about your missions, morals, and purposes. And every multimillionaire will say, the moment you focus on money, you lose sight of the purpose. You're trying to find a solution. And the stronger and better the results of those solutions is, the more money you're going to make. But if you're going, I'm trying to find the cure for cancer to make money, now you're going to charge, you're going to be like, how do I get the most money out of this cure for cancer? Yeah, and it gets And people won't support that. Right. No right. one's going to be, no one wants to help you make money. So you, they, so you, you added in a word that I wrote down here um, that I like, which is like building demand. Yeah. Um, that's a great piece for me to kind of think about, like building demand. Yeah. Um, more people believe in you. More people accept your message. More people feel inspired by you. It creates a demand to want more of that. And then right. you have to supply the content at first. But then they're going to be like, oh, wait, you wrote a book? I <laughs> read your thought process. I want to read your book because maybe it also represents the thing you care about. You know, and uh, some people think backwards. If I have the book, it'll create the demand. But no right. one has read your book yet. Yeah. They haven't opened it up. They don't know what's in it. All they hear is buy my book or it's the greatest book ever. And I am so good. You can't ignore me. And in yeah. reality, it's like, well, all I can do is ignore you because I've never heard of you. Yeah. And I tell people all the time, like, you know, there's so many people with similar books and the only reason why someone's going to buy yours versus someone else's is because they you you've established a connection with them at some point right they you know it's like it's like our favorite actors sometimes we know the movie that they just put out is not good but we love them so we're going to go to the movie like i love julia roberts i don't care yeah. what she stars in i'm going to see it i'm going to sit through it right it's not even it doesn't even become about the the movie it just becomes about the the person that i feel like i'm connected to um yeah. And again, if Denzel Washington's in a project, they don't really put the name of the movie big. They put Denzel Washington's <laughs> name big. Right. Because we're coming for him. <laughs> yeah. It just so happens he's in another movie and yeah. we don't really care what the movie's about ultimately because we know he's in it and he's good. You know, yeah. like he was, he directed Fences. Well, we don't know him as a director, but he's acting it. So I'm interested in that. Yeah. You know, yeah. like, uh, even though it's an amazing uh, play and, and ultimately a good, a good movie. But uh, we have to look at the books, too. If you could break down the way a book is used to make sales. Let me show you something. Great. Yeah, please. All right. So let's say you're walking, not Christopher Walken, but uh, walking through a, a bookstore. Yeah. And you see this. Okay. <laughs> All right, for two seconds, you just yeah. walk past it. Right? Yeah. Okay. Let's say somehow you lucked out <laughs> and you just saw a color that you're like, I like that color. Right. And then you're like, let me look at it. So now you're looking at that. Then you got to go, let me look at the cover. And you're like, oh, okay, I see the cover. Yeah. Right. Now you're, oh, it's thick. Well, let me read the back. Right. That's three moves that had to have happened. That's a lot of, that's a lot of, that's a lot. That's a lot of work. We haven't even gotten to reading. Right. This, I want somebody to go into the bookstore specifically looking for Dr. Sheena Howard books. That's different though, because there's now they are, you're supplying the demand. Exactly. And that's why you get a big shelf. Exactly. Big, exactly. Like you go to, yeah. Stephen King has shelves. Exactly. Okay. So how do we create that demand? What's Branding. the long game? Branding. 
what is your missions, morals, and purposes? And how does that create a solution to the people that follow that? One thing I noticed from you is you're a, you do a lot of self-help stuff. You mm -hmm. speak on self-improvement, even though yep. you are also a writer, you yep. are also a, a ghostwriter. You are also like, you're also, you have a doctor, right? Like all these things are also's, but yeah. the thing that creates the solution is I'm going to hire you to be a ghostwriter because I agree with your thoughts mm. and I know we connect. So if I tell you my story, I know at least fundamentally. Yep. That's I so have, true. Right? So That's so true. Um, that, you know, when I was writing for DMC, one of the things he said, it just speaks exactly to what you just said. He um I was writing something for him and like he was explaining what he wanted and he was like you you know, he was like you know all the things that you already talk about. Just go write that. It's like that is the client, right? The yes. client that can say you already know all the things that you are cuz we're so aligned in our mission and what we're trying to do. We're like Correct. And um, yeah, that's correct. That's why you get hired. Every every and you're not for every everybody, writing, right? Yeah. Every writer, every ghostwriter is not for everybody because back to mission purpose alignment. Yeah. Yes, and I honestly, no one has ever hired me. Read my work. Mm. They were always I think referrals. That's true about me too. But it's for me, not people are watching weird. the content to get the into my, but they're not. If my latest client, if I ask him, have you ever written one of my books? He's going to say, no, only the one that you wrote for me. <laughs> yes, because that's all that matters to them. And they're that allowed to true. break the rules. You can't. Yeah. They yeah, can be selfish. Yep. You're not allowed to be selfish. They, you want to be successful. Yeah. You know, and uh, if you <laughs> imagine you're like, oh, I know you want to hire me, but before you do. Here's my three books. Read them. Make sure it's you like it. No, hire yeah. me. We're gonna make your yeah. because I have to write the book in a voice that represents yeah, their you voice. as well. Yeah. So we're gonna have to have a conversation. You're gonna have yep. to tell me a little bit about yourself. Yeah. But it's the standpoints. Like for example, and this is gonna be an extreme example. But if I was writing a book about a religious journey of somebody who discovers faith in Christ as an example, and they started out in a very lonesome town and they were poor and they, they just found God in there. They, Joan of Arc, the story of Joan of Arc is what inspired them, et cetera, et cetera. And also they're a woman character. And then I meet somebody and right off the bat, I know for a fact because of what they post, they're a Satanist. Mm. Might not fit. Right. You already know, right? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like there are wealthy Satanist from <laughs> Asia, uh, you know, they're from India specifically, and uh, they hate Christians. Right. Like, you already know it's not, yeah, I don't need to read their stuff, exactly. yeah, the brand is already established, but you're perfectly wrong, it. right? Exactly, it's not right for me, you know, yeah. uh, because there's a chance, a very small chance, that the bias will slip in that Christians are horrible and they're going to tell a story that might voice those themes. Mm -hmm. Which is also good, though, in writing. If you're writing narrative fiction, you never want to present a position as right. You yeah. always want to challenge those positions, mm -hmm. uh, you know, have both sides. Like one of the things I always talk about in my stories is violence is very violent in my book because mm -hmm. I want people to be like uncomfortable because violence shouldn't be comfortable. Mm -hmm. But I always have that conversation that sometimes violence is necessary, whereas violence shouldn't be necessary. And then mm -hmm. there's people that are like, well, sometimes, you know, is killing bad if it's for protection, right? So when you represent those themes, it's important to always contradict those themes as well. To be like, well, I'm not right as the as the writer. I, I this is just my position, my claim. So what are what are other claims to that, and and how do I do justice by them? Mm -hmm. And you, you could look at your brand in the same way. Just because you believe in X Y Z doesn't mean you can't post the opposing understanding of it. Mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. now, what are you telling people? that I'm willing mm. to listen, that mm. I'm willing to learn, that mm. I'm willing to explore. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so that's also good. Uh, yeah. I guess I get one more thing and then I'll throw it back to you. Yeah, for uh, sure. Like when I do my YouTube channels, I do, I do not edit my chat, my videos. I just do go the back. lesson, right? I just go straight through. Mm -hmm. uh, so when I'm doing a lesson, I might spell something wrong or mm -hmm. I might mess up or I might have to look something up. Right. And people are like, oh, you should edit that stuff. Like people that don't watch my videos, yeah. that, you know, my friends. And, and I'm like, no, because that's part of my brand. Because I want people to know great writing is rewriting. 
a great writer has a great editor that the process isn't clean and perfect and you don't have to be because mm -hmm. writing is not the words only there's a whole right. there's a other elements to it and i want people to know that we're all the same we're not right. no one is per a first draft is not perfect <laughs> right you know and so that's a part of my brand and i'm not going to talk about that i'm just going to do it Mm -hmm. I'm just mm -hmm. going to represent it, you know, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I think that's important. Yeah. A couple of things. Um, I know we got to go. Yeah, no, no, um, no. You know, one of the reasons why I create so much like self help concept, helping creatives not give up. Hopefully you see my, my content on the day that you wanted to give up and you just give it one more day then another day and you just put one foot in front of the other. But one of the things I realized as a writer is like, I ain't about to be a millionaire by just selling books. Correct. Like this, and, and I had, you know, we, I all started out, started out like everybody else. My first book is going to, you know, be the next big thing. Right. 10,000 sales first week. Exactly. And of course, like most of us, that didn't happen. So I had to learn business, right? I had to learn, okay, what do I represent? How do I turn this into income? in all of the years that I wait for one of my books to sell a million copies. And Services. the thing is, <laughs> if I never have a book that sells a million copies, I will make a million dollars because I've learned business, right? And so yep. to me, it's like, this is the thing I'm doing in between to impact people's lives um, with the goal of maybe one day this thing will happen and maybe it won't, but I'm still successful either way. Um, and that's kind of that's kind of how I figured it out. Ghostwriting, great money. It's in, yes. it's in line with my mission <laughs> and purpose. Um, and I'm getting to write. I think some authors get really stuck. And I'm not judging anybody on the direction that they choose to take. I don't want people to hear it like that. I'm just offering a different avenue. I think some writers get stuck on, I want my book to sell a million copies and be the thing that's going to make me rich. When yeah. I'm like, that's probably not the thing that's going to make you rich. Why don't you do something else in between that dream so that you do get rich? Because um, even like... Listen, even even the, the 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 authors that are making tons of money, they have a brand that sells other things. <laughs> yeah, they <laughs> invest in assets. Exactly, they have. They're making money in other ways besides just the book. Even super, super, super. Uh, even even people that can sell a lot of books. They well, have how did how did Lady money. Gaga make money? I don't know. Tell me. So Lady Gaga was a ghostwriter. I didn't know that. <laughs> she wrote for other artists. Because she wasn't quote unquote attractive. So they didn't really push for her to be an artist. That's why when she first came out, she always had her face covered. And, oh my goodness. And that's why she eventually did the meat dress because she was protesting. She's like, I'm just a piece of meat. Right. Um, but she started out as a very talented writer. She started building her relationships and eventually she became Lady Gaga. Mm. Uh, so authors should think the same way. Like when I, I think so too. I think so too. And because the thing is, on your journey to that book, to the book that you want to sell a million, you'll probably sell a million copies in the 10, 15 years that you're just making money and doing all the things. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm happy writing. I don't need to make the money. You know, like I developed wealth through assets, like, right. you know, but when I was in the music industry, I made more money touring with other people, writing for other people. Like, right. and I wasn't like, if I don't make money and become successful only on my stuff then i am not really i'm terrible i'm right, horrible right. and you're like no like yeah. i want to be in this industry so however that is is how it is right you know because artistically i can write whenever i want but right. if i'm being paid 10 or fifteen thousand dollars to write a book and or I'm even writing? 30 grand to write a script yeah i love it I, I, i'm not gonna say no to that no i love it because i'm still yeah. it, to me it's like i get to practice writing and get paid to do it every every time i write I get to practice writing and I'm making money. I love, I love that. It's making In me different better. genres too. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. Different places. It's just, yeah. 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 Like I, I got hired once to write a, a script for a, a woman client. I have to say she's a woman for the story to make sense. Okay. Uh, and all the characters in the story were also women. Mm -hmm. And the faux pas is that men shouldn't write female characters. I've heard that. Uh, and she hired me without reading my work. And she says, everybody I've talked to, says you're the person i need to hire to write the story Ooh. and then when she told me her story there's like lesbian characters in there oh, i love it yeah all, and i'm just like okay are you sure because <laughs> i am a guy and i know like people are a little uncomfortable with that she's like just write it i trust you and i wrote it and she sent it to a whole bunch of her friends and they were like wow this is really great they love the characters and then she said oh yeah the, uh she told them who wrote it and they were like a guy wrote this 
And so she came back to me. She's like, you know, everyone loves it. But like, why were you able to write the women characters? I was like, oh, because I started with emotion. I started with truth. I started with motivation. Because if you start with uh, they are X and then you go inward, it, you're, it's not interesting. But if you start inward and what is their arc? What is their motivations? What's their challenges, their positions, their, you right. know, all the truth mm -hmm. that all people can have mm -hmm. empathy for or relate mm -hmm. to then it doesn't matter. I could have them have no arms. Right. Because if it's about them having no arms, that's not interesting. <laughs> if it's about them being a successful black woman, yeah. just a success, that's not it's, interesting. Right, right, right. It's the right? person is, the, is, is bringing out who the, the, the decisions they have to make, the challenges they have, the, the yes. relatable human, human elements. Yes, 100%. Because again, if you write a story, I, I tell this uh, to, to people that are like, well, I like even even guy writers or it doesn't matter. They could be women. Right? They'll be like, I'm going to write a story about a strong female character. And I go, why? And you go, because I, that'll sell. Everyone's into. I go, all right, but what's her deal? Yeah. Like, what it, what is her deal? And it's like, yeah, but, you know, I'll just make her do cool things. And I'm like, but I can't relate to that and nor can anyone else. Right. You can't relate to that's if you're going to make a female character relatable, you have to start with the empathy. Mm -hmm. What are the things we can all connect to? Mm -hmm. Because then it doesn't matter if it's an African Nubian princess right. or if it's a, 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 an Asian shogun or right. if it's an Italian mafia guy or if it's a Canadian kind minister or if it's right. a, a Mexican cartel. We can't relate with those concepts right. at all. I don't know about you, but I've never right. been in the cartel. Right. Right. But Absolutely. If you could start with the emotional truth of what they're dealing with, mm -hmm. not that they're dealing with the drugs, not that right. they're dealing with the cartel, but maybe relationships, yes. maybe the struggle for success and to rise in the cartel. Right. Now we're starting to find it's relatable, right? <laughs> all yeah. relatable, right? Yeah. And she was like, Oh, I never even thought of it that way. And I'm like, Well, that's how I was taught to approach everything. It, mm -hmm. from my career to my business to like when I help people write, I'm not helping them write. I'm trying to connect with them mm -hmm. to show where we're both starting at or have started at mm -hmm. the journey. The fact that like you don't have to do it this way, mm -hmm. but you do need these things, mm -hmm. you know, like, for example, if I tell you how to write a story, you do need a beginning. You do need a <laughs> middle. You do need an end. You do need a midpoint conflict that uh, reveals the truth of the lie and ultimately leads to the reversal. You do need an inciting incident. You do need a twist or a pinch. You do need, right? Mm -hmm. But how you go about writing that is the reason that 14 stories in the world, what is it, seven stories in the world, uh, we can make millions of stories because right. it's, it's about perfect. the character, the, 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 yeah, the journey. One more question, Thomas. Let me have can I ask you one more question. Yeah, you could ask me a five. thousand. I have so you you seen a little bit of my content. I'm not assuming that you were like all oh, I people, have seen you enough, right? You didn't know I think you probably know enough about me to get a general idea. That's right. I want a literary agent. What's okay. one and, and I, I take your advice, I love it. All what right. can I offer this agent? Based on just the limited stuff you know about me, and you might have to get back to me on this question because you might need to dig, dig a little deeper. What's something I can offer an agent? I have to qualify that will help them. Be before I answer, I have to yes. qualify your question. Sure. Are we talking about reaching out to agents cold, or are we talking about? A let's assume an agent that I already have a. Let's talk about. Let's let's assume it's an agent I already have a connection point with. Okay. Yeah. So, it's not necessarily what you could bring to agents on a blank slate. It's mm -hmm. what research you do to put into that agent to their needs. Got you. And then you have to relate that to what you are capable of. And it doesn't even have to be expertise. In mm. fact, it could be relationships. You might actually know mm. somebody who is an author who is doing great sales, but they still don't have representation. And you go, hey, I know this author. And now you just introduce them to an author that's already doing the work mm -hmm. that has more sales than you. And you didn't even, you jumped you to give to them. Yes. That agent is going to see you as a value because you're not selfish. Ooh. And that is a version of what can I give to you? Oh. I am not selfish. I am willing to help you grow. Right. But you do have to do the work. You have to. Uh, here's a really general idea for anybody out there. If you're an actor, look at producers that are working on projects and don't ask to be an actor, but ask, what do you need? I see. I see you're doing a movie. Do you have PAs? Do you have, which are production assistants? Uh, do you have a script supervisor? And these are all things you don't do. 
or at least don't, you know, you want to be the actor, but yeah, you yeah. don't ask to be the actor because that's a self, but you go, yeah. well, you know, do, do you have people have invested? Do, do you have a campaign? Do you have a GoFundMe that I can help support and mm. uh, push? And now relate that to every single industry in the world. A writer can do the same thing. Yes. You know? um, the other thing for agents is how many writer friends do you have that you help? And the more wow. authors you help, not mm -hmm. that pay you, mm -hmm. authors that help that you go, I know they don't know this, but I'm going to introduce them to somebody or I gave mm -hmm. them, right? The more you build your circle of influence, which won't influence your career, influence better habits, but they will see your value. And now when they meet an agent, they're going to think of you because you have the value in their mind. So you got to be seen, be present. I said that earlier, right? So those are things you should be doing to best help your agents is yeah. have an established circle of influence that has value. And it doesn't have to just be authors. It could be editors. It could be right. whatever the case may be, right? Distributors. Right. It could be you have ins at stores, right? Right. Uh, but on top of that, if you have the authors, now you're not trying to get an agent. Right. You're trying to choose which one you want to go with. Mm. Because all your friends that you have helped or elevated or let shine. Mm. Like if, you go to, if you go to my social media, do you not often see me sharing other people's stuff, especially mm -hmm. on Facebook? Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. Because I believe teamwork makes the dream work. Dream right? work. <laughs> That's why I, I created it. the nonprofit team rise together, work, I grow, and rise together. And mm -hmm. that's, I believe in that. And that would help you solidify what can I give to this agent? Yeah. Yeah. I love that. It's kind of like what I do with um, um, ghostwriting projects. Like, I, hey, I really like this person, their mission, their vision. And I kind of just follow them. And, oh, like, I really think I can help this person. Like, really, just like, hey, I think I can help you in this area, period. Mm -hmm. And yeah, adding value. Another well, well, another thing you could do. This, this is sales one on one though. Like, let's say you you have a, a client that you're interested in hiring, mm -hmm. uh, being hired for, mm -hmm. and uh, they are talking about a book or they did write a book, mm -hmm. and you go, you know, I could really help them with marketing. Start mm -hmm. marketing their book. Just market their book. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Just yeah. Create create material for it. Give it to them for free. Yeah. But also market it. Like right. show them how you would market it. Mm -hmm. Through your, you know, you don't even have to pay for it, but you can, you can pay right. for ads. But the point is you go, and then you show them your results. Mm -hmm. And then you go, look, this is what I would do for you. Is this better or worse than what you have now? <laughs> you know, because it's the evidence yeah. I've been doing this. How long have you been doing it for? Oh, I did mark. It was a 30 day marketing campaign or yeah. I did a three month blitz. Yeah. And they're like, oh, I didn't, I didn't realize that's an interest. I didn't know that technique right. was possible. <laughs> right. Or, uh, or write out. Here's an, like some people are like, I'm going to be a social media manager. All right. But your social media sucks, which is right. fine. Like I, I'm a marketing guru, right. but I don't really focus on because I I'm retired. Basically, I, right. I just do what I want to do now. I don't yeah. care about the big houses. I care about, yeah, yeah. you know, enjoying myself. Exactly. But as a as a social media mar manager, I'm like, we'll just write out three months worth of social media for them. Show them what you would write. Show them what kind of photos you would use. Take all the photos of their stuff and then repurpose it. Show them, you know, it's not just Facebook, but like, what would that campaign look like? And right. then just do it. Right. <laughs> just, just do it. You know. Uh, yeah. And uh, they'll be like, oh, obviously, obviously, right. you're good at this and you right. care about it, and I'm seeing results. So. <laughs> This sells it, you know, but some people yeah. are like, hire me. I'm, gr I am so good. Right. You can't ignore me. Yeah. But I don't know who you are. It's like when they give you the free teriyaki chicken and it's really good and you go buy the whole platter. <laughs> oh, when you walk past that. In the like, mall. Yeah, yeah. yeah. On the stick. <laughs> and you walk or you do the loop and then you come back to the place that gave you the free teriyaki chicken. Same, same concept, right? Same concept. McDonald's actually does something a little further and more. Uh, they mess with your mind. Really? If, if you drive past McDonald's, do you not usually smell hamburgers? Yeah. Oh, yeah. They do yeah. that on purpose. They they actually have the smell of. Oops, sorry. They, oh. they have the smell of hamburgers come out of the building, and that makes it, sense. It's part of their marketing mm -hmm. click is you smell it. And you're like, oh, yeah. That, it that. gets all in your senses. And it's the McDonald's smell too. It's not like Burger King smells like that. It yeah. is the McDonald's smell. Okay, is the smell branding or marketing? 
that would be brand. And then yeah, letting you saying. smell it is marketing. Okay. Okay. Because they were like, what does our smell? <laughs> that sounds weird, but what is our <laughs> musk? Right. And then if they present it, through, they represent it through presentation, right? They That becomes the marketing part. Okay. So he, okay. here's an example. Like, let's say, let, like, let's say we take your hairstyle and your face contour and we make like a logo out of it. Let's, mm -hmm. you know, like with the, the hair and then like a nice little uh, elegant kind of style to it, right? Mm -hmm. That is us branding something about your look, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. it represents your look. It represents your style, right? Right. Now, I have to put that in front of people for it to be marketing. Mm hmm now, this is where it gets a little bit interesting. If your logo is only to represent your hairstyle and your your, your cheekbones and your, mm -hmm. your chin, that's not full branding, though, because there's no mission, mm -hmm. moral mm -hmm. purpose. Right. But it is visually because a brand is also your, your voice, your image and your message. Right. Your voice is what you stand for uh, uh, or, or more importantly, your voice is is like how I'm how I'm going to talk and say mm -hmm. things, right? The the image is what it looks like, and then the message is what is behind it all. You're, you know, right. really feeling the missions, morals, and purposes. Um, so that brand as an image alone would not be as powerful as well. What is it I care about? Mm -hmm. So uh, my hair is very. Uh, in your case, you could say my hair represents a community. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. My my uh my earrings represent a community. So right, right, right. my style is a part of my I want to represent my community. So that's mm -hmm. a purpose mm -hmm. or a mis my mission mm -hmm. is to bring light to my community. Mm -hmm. So now we're now we're actually giving mm -hmm. value to that logo. Mm -hmm. And then when we present that logo, we know that well in our presentation on mm -hmm. social media, I don't necessarily have to be like my community is right. Blank, blank, blank. You're, you're visually telling the story. Yeah, you're visually telling the, the story. The, correct, yeah, correct. Yeah, but, yeah. but you could bring in elements of that community. But the moment you start going, I believe in bringing my community right. to the forefront. Now, now you're selling. Now right. You're selling. <laughs> you know? I love that. I love that. Thank okay. you so much, Thomas. This was great. I really enjoyed talking to you. Yeah, no, I had a lot of fun too. I'd, I'd love to do it again. Oh, it, yeah, it, anytime. If I may ask you one question before we go, as oh, I ask all questions uh, to end the show, I ask every author this question. All right. Yes. Boom. What is one piece of advice you discovered about writing either through someone else or you doing the research that completely changed the way you approach the writing process? Um, being actually studying the Bible. Okay. Not for the religious elements before the storytelling <laughs> techniques oh like in the book of matthew where uh, jesus was thing. speaking like he was yeah. drowning if you study it study it like i'm learning storytelling techniques that is that is a great place to study storytelling techniques that obviously have lasted a really long time so you you took the bible Yes. Uh, well, you know, you paid for it, I'm sure. I just <laughs> dissected it. This is how the story started. This is right. This was yeah. the journey. In the beginning. Of, yep. <laughs> yes. In the beginning. Yep. And kind of just studied the storytelling aspects from a technical perspective. And it really helped me um, become a better storyteller. Interesting. As a follow up to that, uh, mm -hmm. the only thing I, I'm not sure is if you write narrative, non uh, narrative fiction. I know you write non. I've seen your books on the nonfiction, but when you approach fictional narrative, yeah. how does the understanding of the Bible's story process add to your narratives? Yeah. So yes, I do write fiction. Actually, one of my best written books, I think, is my is my fiction book called Nina's Whisper. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think just the. For me, I didn't study writing in school. Like I don't have a degree in writing. And so the Bible was a good place to show me like beautiful, like sentence structure, more poetic, adding more poetic elements into the way I write. Because I'm a very straightforward person. Very, I guess that probably comes from my academic um, nonfiction background. Yeah. So to become a fiction writer is even different than like writing comics. Um, I had to just learn a more poetic, gentle way of writing. I think the studying the Bible helped me with that. And then just um, storytelling, hero's journey, really just 
trying to, it's not always an exact science, obviously, but plotting those onto the di different stories in the Bible. Um, I got to kind of see how you can tell a story that will keep people wanting to turn the page. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's what like, I would say. Like Judas with his 30 silvers. I mean, there's consequences. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and listen, I'm not well versed in the Bible. Like I was oh, really right. studying it from a, a technical place, but, um, yeah. Well, I'm Sicilian, so I was forced to read it as a Catholic, and then I abandoned that faith uh, when my mom became a born again. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, well, if she doesn't believe in it, why do I have to believe in it? <laughs> and then my brother became a rabbi, and then so that he's Jewish. Mm -hmm. And then my other brother became a, a, a priest in the uh, Universal Life Church that you get online. Oh, wow, yeah. And he paid $5, and he got a title of wizard. And wow. I was like, okay, I'm going to try to find my own faith. I'm on the path, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, this <laughs> Weird dinner table. Yeah. Weird dinner table. Yes. I love it. I like I like I like the different perspectives at the dinner yeah. table. I love it. Yeah. It's all there. Uh but uh so how how do people find you, Dr. Sheena Howard? Yes, I'm well branded. I'm at Dr. Sheena Howard. So D R S H E E N A H O W A R D. That's TikTok, that's Instagram, that, that's everywhere. Dr. Sheena Howard is the website. Or SheenaCHoward.com. You can get to it either way. Mm -hmm. um, most active on Instagram. That's where I kind of build community. I can really kind of get in the DMs and send you audio messages and all that good stuff. And uh, yeah, those are LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn as well. Yeah. LinkedIn. And uh, all her links will all, well, her, her website will be linked into the description below as well as her YouTube channel. And uh, if you're listening to this on the audio only, uh, you should check it out on the uh the video because uh we're, we're both very attractive people yes uh, you know obviously i hide half my face with my beard so that's why i'm attractive at all but uh otherwise i have no chin <laughs> it's all smoke and mirrors you know? <laughs> but other than that uh dr howard thank you so very much for uh coming out and uh giving me your time and having a really nice conversation this was fun thank you all right, let's do it. Let's say the goodbyes to everybody who's listening, watching, and playing along. I'm Thomas J. Beleza, and you've been listening to The Right Mindset Podcast. And as always, keep developing the right mindset. I'll see you next time. Bye!